Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this screening and panel discussion called Sound, Silence, and Eco-Experimental Film. My name is Shannon Brownlee, and I teach in the Cinema and Media Studies program in the Fountain School of Performing Arts at Dalhousie University. So I'm so excited to be able to share these films with you and give you a chance to hear from and also ask questions of the filmmakers we have tonight with us in the live stream. Um, that said, this panel actually started from quite a negative place, which is that the film industry does have negative environmental impacts. Um, so we probably don't think of it that often, but there's a lot of there can be a lot of waste created through catering, through um, uh, the building of sets on larger budget productions. There can be a lot of international travel um, producing high carbon emissions. And traditionally, celluloid was manufactured and processed using very harsh chemicals. So digital video has maybe responded to some of the last to a certain extent, but um, even hard drives are not carbon neutral either. So the filmmakers that you're going to be hearing from and whose work you'll be seeing tonight respond to these problems in a variety of really interesting ways. And in so doing, they create absolutely beautiful images, but they don't just create images. There's also each film that we're going to see tonight uh, has a really different kind of sound that complements and supports, but also that, um, that takes its own flights of fancy uh, alongside of those images. So the first film we'll be seeing tonight is called Jay. It's co-directed by Solomon Nagler and it, with an absolutely beautiful score by Lucas Pierce. So we'll be talking to both Saul and, and Lucas afterwards. And the approach that Saul took uh, in making this film was working with 16 millimeter film, the old sort of celluloid, but using a kind of reduce, reuse, recycle approach. So he and his co-director went through archives and they repurposed old images and recast them in ways that are both aesthetically beautiful, that are a form of recycling, but they're also a really sort of challenge, they really challenge us to think about um, how we're haunted by the past and, and how how we might reimagine celluloid history. The second film up is, uh, is Rena Thomas's Emerge, which is abs has the most exquisite qualities of image. It's also perfectly silent. So I'm very excited. I, I would love to hear from people if you, um, if sounds come into your mind as you're watching it, or if, if, if you imagine a score um, I'd love to hear from, from you during the panel discussion. Um, so Rena's approach to this kind of question of environmental impact was to use a process called eco-processing. Now this was begun in the 1990s uh, when experiments were done using coffee instead of harsh chemicals to process celluloid film. So Rena's, Tom is, uh, Rena's film is also on 16 millimeter film, um, but she actually processed it using eucalyptus tea and low tox bleach and the results are absolutely exquisite and um, very textural and then the last film we have up is also an example of eco-processing this film is anthology for fruits and vegetables by don george and don george uh, don will be visiting us during the panel and it it is playful it is uh celebratory and it, it is it's exciting in that she also used 16 millimeter but processed it using uh, a variety of plant and vegetable uh, teas, some of which are actually reflected in the vegetables that she's filming about. So she was she was actually using the materials of the vegetables that are that also feature in the film. And then the other really exciting thing about this film is that uh, the soundtrack gives voice to these to these vegetables in just a wonderful way. So um, and I, I, I'm looking forward to your comments on the screening. Um, before I give you the instructions of how to get to that screening, I just wanna ask you to please think about where you are geographically. I'm in Mi'kma'ki, which is the unceded and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, this area is governed by the Peace and Friendship Treaties. And these treaties have not consistently been honored at all. Um, and, and this is important tonight because environmental destruction is not racially neutral. Um, if we upheld these peace and friendship treaties, 
as well as doing some other things, um, this would have a significant social and environmental impact. So I ask you to think about where you are, what treaties govern your area, and um, how upholding those treaties might do a lot for both social and political as well as environmental justice. So the if you look below you um, in the description, uh, if you look, sorry, if you look below me in the description, um, there's a there's a Vimeo link to the three films and a password that you'll need to enter in order to access those. And then a little further down, there's also information on how you can ask questions during the live stream or, or make comments for the filmmakers. So thank you so much for your time tonight. The screening is about 25 minutes. So at seven o'clock or so, we'll come back to this live screen with those four filmmakers. Thanks so much and enjoy the films.
Hi, everyone. Good evening and welcome back. Uh, so we are in the music room now in Chibokto, Halifax. Um, and I'm very uh, excited about, show, uh, about uh, introducing this panel. So um, you've already seen the intro video probably. My name is Shannon Brownlee, and I'm in the Fountain School of Performing Arts at Dalhousie University. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a bit about the format before I introduce each of the artists. Um, so the, the films, it, uh, the panel will be for the next hour or so, and then if you haven't had a chance to see the films yet, the films will be available for an additional half hour or so after the panel. Um, and I'm going to get us started with some questions, but we're, we really welcome questions from anyone uh, watching live this evening. Um, and you can send questions by tweeting at Dal Cinema, by emailing adcinema at dal.ca, or uh, by just putting, putting your comments in the chat for this stream, or by uh, putting comments in the Vimeo pages for the individual films in the showcase. Um, so, and all, all of that is, uh, is listed under the YouTube window that you are no doubt watching right now as well. So, um, this is a very exciting and slightly strange experience for me. I, I, this, is, this is new, so I'm talking to a camera. Um, okay, so, uh, yes, so everyone welcome back and, and welcome to this event. And um, I am going to, so I'm just going to introduce the artists and then ask each of them a question and then open it up to the audience. So, um, first of all, Dawn George at the far end there uh, is an artist. She works um, in film, video, and installation, and her work has been shown around the globe. She's also a founding member of the Handmade Film Collective, very exciting collective, and as you will learn, a brilliant gardener and naturalist. Um, next is Rena Thomas, who, um, who is a film installation and performance artist. And she's especially interested in topics of body and landscape and memory, which are important themes for this evening, um, and, and particularly in relationship with the landscape. Uh, next along is Lucas Pierce, who is a composer, a sound editor, a musician, and a visual artist, uh, very multi-talented. Um, Lucas has uh, composed for films uh, such as uh, Bretton Hanum's North Mountain, for those of you who might have seen that one, and um, he's the director of, uh, or, sorry, the artistic director of Ups the Upstream Music Association. He's a professor at NASCAD and also a teacher through the Center for Film, uh, S Center for Art Tapes, sorry, through the Center for Art Tapes here in Chibokto, Halifax. And then finally, Saul Nagler is a professor of film production at NASCAD. Originally from Winnipeg, his films have been shown at the Toronto International Film Festival, in Ottawa, in Paris, across Australia and New Zealand. Um, and some of, it, some of his work is, uh, is theatrical film, some of it is celluloid-based installations. So these are our artists. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure you've enjoyed their work, if you've had a chance to just watch it right now. And um, I'm going to start with just one question for each person, and I'm going to start with Lucas. Starting with sound, because I think that sound is so often, uh, when we're talking about film, sound is often the sort of the second thing we consider after visuals. So I want to start right off the bat with sound. Um, so Lucas, can you please start by telling us about your involvement with the Project J and how you and Saul worked together on that film and, and how you approached the project? And I wonder if you could say a bit about um, composing for film versus design, doing sound design, and what the overlaps and differences are for you. Sure, uh, thanks. That's, there's a whole lot in that question, and I'll, I'll try to stay focused to them. Um, with regards to this film, Jay, it was the first project that uh, Solomon and I worked on together, and um, happily not the last. And, it really was an interesting process because I kn knew from the visual plan and from the process-oriented plan all along that the uh, that it was going to an optical print and that it would that therefore has very different constraints on what kind of sound is possible, especially compared to the modern abilities of the digital sound studio and digital audio workstations. 
Can I just interject? Um, so, uh, uh, so for audience members, I have asked all the panelists to be technical and to really nerd out, but I might interject occasionally just to, to explain. So, so when you say it was going to optical print, it was going to be finished on 16 millimeter film instead of digital. Is that, is that yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. And what that does for sound, and I'll explain it, is that it forces the sound to comply with the limited frequency range available and the limited dynamic range available which means that there's no real high frequencies, there's no real low frequencies, there's an exaggeration of some mid-range frequencies which tend towards uh, those that are occupied by the vo human voice because that's how they were tweaked back when those standards were developed. And um, the uh, analog nature of it means that there's not a great distant difference between the loud and the soft sounds. So it's very, it's a very tight constraint technically uh, in order to do any sort of sound for it. When it came to the film uh, and composing for it, it was a, a challenge that was quite different than other films I've worked on because um, the express or even implied meanings of the film were not really things that we discussed. What we did discuss, what we saw would show me a version and show me another version and I would kind of respond to it. Um, and we talked a lot about other music. We talked a lot about what kind of music he liked, what kind of ideas were involved in making choices around the process. And you know, a, an upfront uh, perspective, which was that if this is clear to the audience or not, is really not the point. What really is the point is the overall feeling that we get from it. So I started working with that. And, um, you know, from our conversations, and which overlapped with my own interests in some of the um, kind of uh, Baltic minimalist composers' styles, uh, you know, which are things that I, I know more than the first thing about, started using those, uh, some techniques in the compositional uh, approach, which, you know, again, to nerd out a little bit, is being, um, yeah, being expressly ambiguous about the tonal uh, dynamics within the piece, which is actually a little bit harder to put together than you might think, it, it, because it, it's a way of approaching uh, that's not atonal at all. It actually is using a lot of perfect intervals, but instead uh, which direction the resolutions go and the suspensions uh, of uh, harmonic motion are continually deferred, which results in something which has a sort of suspended feeling, uh, which is a way to elongate tension. You know, the, the so-called holy minimalists use this to create a, a sense of religious ecstasy. I'm, I'm interested in it, how it creates a sense of, um, you know, delayed uh, resolution and about how something's gonna happen, but you don't know how long it's gonna take. Um, the other thing that, that I worked with those with techniques related to that, which I think, which I did work with the visual patterning and the visual pacing was trying to find um, harmonic and melodic gestures that could repeat in different ways without them being uh, an exact repetition with the different layers repeating at different times so that there would be a sense of motion but also not a sense of resolution really at any point. Um, but then it was all really constrained uh, by the choice of instrumentation. I decided to do it all as, as double bass. It's only double bass. Uh, you know, I'm a double bassist, and that, but you know, as a composer, I can work with all kinds of different sounds, but I really wanted something that was really gritty, like the texture of the film. And as a string instrument, the double bass, Arco, is a very gritty sound. But the challenge that with that was very interesting with the optical print because much of the sound of the bass is chopped off, the highs and the lows. And the result, I feel, is something which ends up being quite ambiguous as to what the instrumentation is because of the process. And I liked to think that that was following some of the, um, you know, a, a, rhyming with some of the visual senses. So that's often how I think about things, is that they, they kind of rhyme with, they're not echoing, they're not the same, they're not copying, 
but they do rhyme with it structurally, with this idea of there being a, uh, an inherent texture, an inherent limitation, but also this sense that you can't see exactly what is going on at first, but I'm, 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 I can assure you that upon repeated viewings, some things do become clearer. And I like to think that the music was working in a parallel way. As to your question about sound design, I feel that that's, it's kind of a different um, axis of, uh, of logic than, than music, although they relate. They, they're, they're, they're sort of perpendicular to each other, not at cross purposes. And there are definitely points when they overlap. And in some of my other work with, with Saul, I tr have tried very hard to blur the line between sound design and, uh, and music so that it, it's sometimes um, the elision between, say, a musical gesture and an ambient and an environmental ambience is very uh, is very um, blurred, so that uh, is, one gets the sense that you're not sh sure which one is which, which I like to think creates an aura of uh, of kind of subtle magic. So Great. I hope that that's answering some of your questions. Thank you, thank you. I love that idea of rhyming the image and the sound. Because um, it does, it means that one is not slavishly following the other, but there is that um, resonance between them. That's that's a really great way and, of thinking. And like about a it. rhyme, there are different ways to rhyme. There can be an right. internal rhyme. Right. There yeah. can be a deferred rhyme. Yeah. There can be a rhyme that really is on the nose. Yeah. That there is different ways to have that relationship still be expressed, but not be. Um, uh, repetitive in its uh, in its presentation. Mm, yeah, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna now ask Saul um, if you could explain a bit about uh, the impetus for the project and the aesthetics, um, the, specifically the aesthetics of, of recycling images. Um, but and also if you could explain to us how celluloid film is generally made and processed. And I'd like to say to the audience. I'm sort of putting Saul in the position of the bad guy here, um, asking him to talk about conventional celluloid production and processing. Um, but he has done eco-processing as well, and, um, and he, he definitely is not the bad guy. He's recycling here. He's, he's uh, experimented with a lot of different, um, very environmentally friendly forms. Um, but I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to ask you to explain the big bad chemistry yeah. Yeah, of it. I, don't, I, don't, I mean, I don't think that conventional film processing is necessarily the worst evil of our times. But I, I, I am I am very very enthusiastic about um, the stuff that uh, that I've been introduced to from the, the Handmade Film Collective, and it's very inspiring what they're doing, and it's very inspiring to my own practice and what I what I do now. It's some it's some of the work that I do now, but. Um, yeah, so, you know, um, so what's interesting about this film is that this film is, like, one of my, like, I guess it's co-authored with uh, uh, one of my dear friends uh, and extremely talented filmmaker, Alexandre de Rose. And, um, you know, it's, and I, I think that Alex and I are very different filmmakers. Our, our works are very, very different. I encourage all of you to look up his work. He's, he's a very renowned filmmaker and you know I, I and it's interesting it, it is one of the first films I made when I came to, came here to uh, Chibuktuk in Halifax and um, and you know we teach together I, I teach with Lucas and I've been so I've been so privileged to have worked with on many projects with Lucas and none of my films would have done as well or been as great without your collaboration so I feel very grateful to be on this panel with you um, and so I had moved here, and, and I really, to be honest, I, I was sort of longing a bit for some of my friends that I moved away from in Montreal and in Winnipeg, and um, I thought, well, I'd like to sort of find a way of keeping those connections going. So what Alex and I decided to do, we thought, wouldn't it be fun if we tried to make a film together, even though we have absolutely nothing in common? So what we did is we actually um, were individually, and I'll get into the sort of technical specifics of it, we were individually um, working with um, images that weren't ours, so we didn't own them, and that was a way of a really good starting point for us, that none of us own these images to begin with, and so that's a really good sort of neutral ground for us to have a way of working together um, on a project that is primarily appropriated or, or, or found footage, um, recycled footage. And we went on to make other works together um, that were around that idea. But the, the other film that we made was on our family's um, film archive. And again, not films that we shot, but then we ended up working on. 
Um, so a bit of history of the film is that I, to support my art practice, I was working in social services. I was working as a support worker for um, youth and um, it was a wonderful and a horrific experience because if anyone that works in the in, this, in sort of social work, in, I guess it is an industry, they realize that it's it, it really a system that perpetuates a level of of level of um, you know exploitation, specifically of um, you know uh, populations that are, are have been exploited and, and and you know taken advantage of for for since since this line was colonized and I was trying to find a way of just really um, getting that out of my body because it was such a traumatizing experience. So. In, back in the day in ASCAT, they used to have a 16 millimeter film uh, library in the, in, in the basement of this very old, stinky building. And when I had moved here by myself, I was sort of, you know, we were looking at films together. And actually, I think Lucas came to some of these screenings where we were finding these old prints. And there was a lot of old um, prints that were um, films that were by social services to convince people to adopt their children out and about what, what happens if you're, uh, you know, if, you're, if you find out you're pregnant and adoption is an option. They're really very, very problematic films. And so I was selecting these films to sort of somehow find a way that maybe I could use it to express my own sort of like specific personal idea of what I think, you know, the, you know my experience social services. And, you know, when we talk about recycled film image, there's like two things you can do. On the one hand, you either look at the narrative that's in the footage itself and you try to rework it, or you treat the material as, as, as material and you sort of work it as a way of playing with texture. You print it, you paint on it, you manipulate it. So I was sort of going between those two strata with Alex, because Alex's work is much more abstract, but my work is a little more narrative. So we were sort of, you know, vibrating back and forth between those two techniques. And um, specifically, the technique that we use is uh, using an optical printer, which is basically a camera that rephotographs the film frame by frame. Um, uh, uh, my, my two uh, colleagues whose work I really admire also have tortured themselves with this machine. <laughs> so they know that it, it is not necessarily, it can be fun, but it is very, it is very, very time consuming. Uh, and, but it's wonderful because it really makes you slow down. So what I would do is I would, I would, I would take my portion and, and use the optical printer here in, in, in Halifax and I would send the footage to um, Alex in Montreal. We literally were posting back and forth using that time of, you know, using a lab to process the film and then them getting the film and then looking at it via post. So it was like this weird two-week delay that we had and that's how we collaborated and then eventually we met together in Montreal on the big optical printer that was uh, at Main Film, which is a film co-op there, and to finish the film um, that way. So that's sort of the process. Is that, mm, yeah. That's the question. Yeah. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about some of, I guess, I mean, you, you mentioned sending the, the film to the lab. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll ask Dawn to explain the, she can, she can uh, explain the conventional processing technique. So um, next question for Dawn. Uh, so you're a leader in eco-processing and, uh, and I've taken Dawn's workshops on eco-processing and they're awesome. Um, so I just wondered if you could tell us what that is um, and how, how the, um, uh, how eco-processing uh, differs from conventional processing, and also for you in this film in particular, an anthology for fr fruits and vegetables, how the process of eco-processing interacts with the, with the subject matter of the film. Um, right, thank you for saying I'm a leader. Uh, I feel like I'm more of an enthusiastic uh, filmmaker that likes to, to share things, uh, to, to share the work. Um, but I just want to preface it with I did not discover eco-processing. It's, it's been around for, for quite a long time. Um, and it was originally discovered, uh, I guess it came kind of into being in 1995, but I hear that um, filmmakers in the Second World War were processing film this way. And I was kind of thinking about that and thinking like, why would they be processing it in the field? doesn't really make sense. There's kind of a lore around that, but but uh, there's certainly more research needs to go into that. But it, it kind of started with um, uh, Dr. Scott Williams, who's a professor at um, the Rochester Institute of Technology, and he um, did a workshop on um, photographic chemistry, and he kind of challenged his class to find household items, maybe things that weren't so, um, uh, chemically uh, intense and try to find a developer that way. And they ended up finding um, or discovering caffeinol, which is instant coffee, washing soda, and, and vitamin C. Um, and there's been like a whole community that has kind of built up on that. Um, 
And one of them, another person was Daggy Bernhardt, um, and she's a filmmaker that's based out of um, Berlin, and she does a lot of things with plants. They discovered that the, uh, the cathic acid um, has phenols in it, and that's like really the thing that works as the developer. Um, and the vitamin C kind of acts as um, an accelerator to the developer, and then the washing soda kind of ups the pH level, which is important when you're developing film. Um, and so she's been working a lot with plants, and I kind of, uh, kind of took her lead and started doing things with weeds, and then kind of took it to the whole new level with 26 uh, fruits and vegetables. Um, and also, uh, together we started, uh, Rena and, uh, and also her Terrier, we also started the Handmade Film Collective, um, which kind of focuses on eco-processing, but also, um, more like handmade film as well, and just kind of like sp sp spreading that knowledge. Um, and thank you for taking our workshop. Um, so uh, what it is with um, the uh, anthology for fruits and vegetables is that I uh, boiled down um, each plant, so like uh, avocado, um, cut it up, boiled it down, and got um, like a tea that you can use, and then mix that with washing soda um, and vitamin C, and then you uh, develop your film with it um, for a certain amount of time at a certain amount of temperature. And I'm making this all sound like it's like super easy, but there's so, there's so much testing that goes into it. Um, and that's where kind of, uh, it's good to take really good notes, um, um, be a little anal retentive with that. Um, so that gives you, um, will give you the negative image, um, but I wanted a positive image. So I used um, another process um, called an eco-reversal bleach, and that is made with um, vinegar and hydrogen peroxide and water. And what that does is that that, that bleaches the film, takes away um, kind of the silver, and exposes like the latent image um, that was there before, and then you put it onto some bright light, and then put it back in the second developer, and then you will get like the exact exposed images. So the whites are white, and the blacks are black. My, do, 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 what was the second part of your question? Um, <laughs> actually, uh, uh, I mean, you've answered my question, mm -hmm. but can you talk a bit, a bit about the t tinting and toning? Oh, yes. As well? So this film, Lots of great color in it. It's it's this one is digitally inspired by tints and tones. Um, there there was no uh, real tints and tones like because you can do it with the vegetables, right? Um, and I've tried it. It works a lot, and it depends on the on the uh, the film stock. Um, like Triax works really well for tinting and toning, and the way that you create uh, or not toning, sorry, tinting. Um, toning is a whole other thing that you can't do with, uh, with vegetables. Um, and the way that you can create a tint is um, by, again, just like soaking the vegetables, just like you would uh, like a, a dye for if you were dyeing wool or something like that. Um, and then you just you soak your film in it. Um, but something that, that didn't work so well with this film, I mostly used um, a, stock called 3378, which is a really um, wonderful stock, but it doesn't take tints so well. So I made all these tints, um, but they just didn't adhere to the film. A few of them did, like the strawberry did, and that was neat. Um, the eggplant did, but most of them didn't. So I just took those tints um, and used uh, their color and digitally enhanced them that way. Cool. Thank you so much. And then last but definitely not least, Rena. Um, so the first time I saw your film, I was just so in love with those sparkles, and I still am, but those sparkles. Um, and and I, I just, I, they're so beautiful. And I, I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit about how you achieved that effect. Um, and also how the, uh, how the processing for you interacts with the subject matter. And I'm especially interested in the silence um, and and whether that's something you you particularly like to play with or an expedient because of the, where you were shooting. Totally. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm a very DIY filmmaker, so my preferred way of making films would be shoot the film, which is like a $20 cartridge, so it's super accessible. For all you new filmmakers who really want to make a quick film, this is what I would suggest. Shoot a film of 3378 16 millimeter film on a Bolex, which you can rent at AFCOOP. <laughs> and it's 20 bucks for a roll of film, and then you can process it in your own bathroom, which is what I do with plants. And you can learn that all from these handmade film uh, eco-processing workshops. Um, and then after it's, I actually reverse it with this reversal method, uh, method that Don was talking about, um, which is just a hydrogen peroxide kind of solution, which makes it a positive image. Then you can project it onto even a wall. Heaven forbid the, the mega film geeks would say that was bad because you can get, you know, lines on the wall and stuff. But I don't really care. I like it all. <laughs> so then I just digitally um, use a DSLR to film that. And then I have a movie. You know, it's done. I shoot, I, I edit everything in camera. So I'm just shooting what I want. And then I go to the other place and shoot what I want instead of editing in a post-production. It was, I think, after, so I've been out of art school now for eight years, and I think after art school I was kind of like, you know what, I want to move into moving image. I was doing uh, still photography at the time. Um, I moved into Super 8 film, which is a, a, a little bit of a skinny, it's 8 millimeter instead of 16 millimeter, so the quality is like a little bit lower, but I still love Super 8. I still have a deep love for Super 8. I just, I kind of got on the 16 millimeter train through Dawn, <laughs> especially this film stock, 3378, which is great for eco film processing. Maybe not for the tinting, but for everything else, it's really, <laughs> it's really quite uh, stark and beautiful because there's really strong contrasts in the color, or in the, not color, but in the blacks and the whites. Um, so I think to answer your question about sound, I simply didn't put it. <laughs> I just didn't put it in because it was just easier. And I, I'm making all my films just like on my own. I don't have very little funding um, or no funding, so I just make films as cheaply and as efficiently as possible to express. I think it's hard enough as artists to kind of express your ideas, you know, let alone all the technical uh, side of things. And I, I do love the techn technicality of like the tangibility of film. Um, but anything that's super, <laughs> that takes a lot more skill, I'm kind of like, if you learn how to do the basic thing, just do that. And then you can just like, you know, fart out a bunch of films and then you've made them. And that's amazing, you know? And then you can tweak them and do funny things. And I have ads, added sound to a few films, <laughs> but most of my films are purely silent because it was easier, you know? And I kind of love it. Like I kind of, you know, I do love the, I'm, I am a very visual learner and visual person, and I'm a very, you know, body person, so I really do love being able to just kind of watch and, and take in with, with fewer, um, sensa uh, you know, less sensations. Um, but a lot of it is really just practicality of, like, make an efficient film, and it, it just felt really accessible to me, you know? Like, a practice that was really, like, I'm just going to make this work, and then you know, maybe a festival will take it, cool. <laughs> Sounds great, you know? So that's kind of how, I don't remember the beginning part of your question, but that's the sound piece. Um, the beginning was just asking you about how you'd achieve those amazing oh, sparkles. Oh, sparkles, so same thing, so sparkles, <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> Don, Don taught me ecofilm processing, which is amazing, and I, and I love it. Um, and I am definitely not as meticulous as her, which is cool. And I really like, you know, <laughs> the fruits and vegetable film is very uh, evident of your, you know, um, your study of this process, which I think is, is so beautiful in and of itself. But I think my process is a lot more throw some film in a bucket, it's gonna get scratched, it's gonna get messed up, and weird things gonna, are gonna happen. And sparkling is one of those things that occurred. So I'm pretty sure what happened was the hydro, hydrogen peroxide reversal bleach, which is one of the, so I, again, Dawn puts her films in Lomo tank, which is like a way of not scratching your film, which is really great, but I, I just don't like it because it's one more machine I have to use, so I just throw them in buckets. So mine goes into like a developer, a water to stop the film from developing, and then it goes into the uh, reversal bleach, and then I shine it up to some light, goes back into the developer, and then I water wash it. Um, that's all I do. I don't even fix it because of the reversal. So I think in, in the process of the sparkle effect, I think that my reversal bleach um, was a little bit expired or it was just that that amount of film was not meant to be used in that little amount of 
you know, hydrogen peroxide solution. So basically it was a little bit expired, which made, I don't understand the science behind it, I don't understand the chemistry behind it, but it just made these sparkles, which has happened in other films by accident as well. And yes, like maybe you could try to recreate this, and I think, you know, Dawn has had some cool sparkly effects as well, like with the eggplant and with other vegetables and, and things. Um, however, I just don't like try to redo things necessarily. I like the magic of something happening that wasn't meant to happen and kind of how that can be a part of, um, that's kind of a part of my process, I, mm. I guess I, I would say. Thank you so much. Um, I am just going to ask, see if there are any questions coming in over social media. Nothing much yet. Okay. Um, anyone is, is of course welcome to drop us a message through the chat, the tweet at Dell Cinema, um, email at adcinema at dell.ca or, uh, or leave comments on the Vimeo showcase. Um, but uh, yeah, so we'll, we'll keep checking for, we'll keep checking for questions. Um, but actually, since we are talking about sound, I, I wondered if I could bounce back to Dawn and if you could say something about the sound, yeah, uh, I... sound design for that. And, and also this question of sort of sound design versus composition, musical composition for film. Like, have you done, you know, musical composition? How do you, like, how do you approach sound design? Um... Was one quick mess. One okay. question which is actually related. Somebody okay. asked, uh, "How did you decide what voice to give each vegetable?" Oh yes, so, yes, that will question, be included. Question, Thank you. So the question is, um, how did how did Don uh, decide which voice to give each veg vegetable as well? Yes, um, I'll talk first about uh, sound design versus composition. I do have a bit of a music background. Um, but I would consider it more sound design. I would consider it, uh, there's some, maybe even like, not for this piece, but a lot of the, the pieces that I uh, create are uh, with sounds that are found in my kitchen or sounds that I record outside and then kind of cut them up and slow them down or speed them up. Like, I wanna say that the correct term analogy for that is music concrete. Is that, a, is that a real thing? I've been reading up, researching about it. Um, but for this, um, I, I really wanted it to start out very organic, um, but putting fire and wind and water on plants, um, fruits and vegetables, they all kind of sound the same. Um, so I decided to uh, go with my voice and kind of maybe connect those fruits and vegetables to my mouth. Um, and I had done uh, some theater work in the past and a lot of um, like voice and speech class. Um, so I decided because I was doing the 26, I was gonna use the letter for uh, the first letter of each plant um, as the sound. So the, the avocado would be ah. And I know there's a lot of problems with this because the letter A has like three sounds. So there's like acorn and apple, like A or ah but I chose awe. It's my film and it's, that's my creative, what I wanted to do with it. Um, so that's how that came about um, for each, each fruit and vegetable. And the way that I did that was that I'd, after I finished recording them and transferring them digitally, I'd play them back um, like two or three times and then just like, just uh, kind of noodle, noodle around with my voice going, Oh, just doing a lot of things that I would see in the vegetables and just kind of improvising with the vegetable. Um, and then I would take that file and cut it up into like tiny little clips that were pure. Because sometimes there's clicks, there's like the refrigerator going, something's going by. Um, so a very pure clip. Um, and the way that this was edited was very back and forth. So looking at um, the avocado and then taking a sound that I thought would go with it. Um, and then taking the next clip of the avocado and taking another sound and, and just going back and forth all the way through until I finished the avocado. Um, there was kind of like a through line. I was gonna go A, B, C, D, E all the way down. Um, but visually it wasn't working. Um, and audibly it wasn't working, audibly it wasn't working as well. Um, so I ended up, um, again, kind of coming up with kind of like a system. Um, 
uh, like the, the D and the T, the Della and the Tomatillo kind of follow each other. And, that, and the reason why they follow each other is because of the D, the da 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 da, and the ta 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 ta. If you do this at home, da 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 da, um, it's your, uh, it's this, your mouth is in the same shape, um, but you're just kind of da 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 da. It's just kind of uh, moving your mouth tiny, tiny, and uh, a little inflection. Um, so that influenced some of the changes in that. Um, but then there's other places in the film, like the mushroom going to um, the yam, and that's just based on, on a visual, right? Um, so that is how that was created. But it was a very like back and forth process. But I, I, really, I really enjoyed it. Like, it was so, it was just so much fun like to, to come up with, with this, the sounds. Um, and it's all one voice, it's all my voice. Um, and just digitally affected. So. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, do we have no questions? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wondered if, um, uh, so it's interesting that like the, the J was finished on film and um, the other two works were, were finished digitally. I, I wonder if all of you could just talk a little bit about kind of analog versus, analog versus digital um, and what you find inspiring either auditorily or visually or both. Um, about working with analog creation versus digital creation. Um, so maybe you could, maybe we could just kind of go down okay, the line. Sure. I'm going to put you on the spot. Well, I mean, Lucas and I have done, oh God, we've been like seven films together. My gosh, including a feature, which was crazy. But, um, but we finished two of them on film, right? And actually a more recent one on film. And uh, so the last film, actually the last one we worked together on was on 16 millimeter, the Geniza one, right? Um, so one thing that's really changed is the quality of the labs you can work with, um, to be perfectly frank. Um, you know, back when we made J, there were more labs in Canada and the quality of the optical print was, was frankly better. And even the quality of the release prints were better. Um, but, and so we have, uh, you know, and, um, and Jay was actually also shot, uh, I was very specific about the film stock that I was using, so as much as I like 3378, there's one that I like much better, which is called 7363, which is now sort of discontinued, but maybe not, I don't know, maybe you know more I about it. I used it before, so yeah, more recently. It's still around, yeah. I thought they, there's some sort of, yeah, I think, so that was the stock that they used to make optical sound, right? And uh, so it's very different from the stock that uh, 3378, has, uh, no, no, so 378 is my optical sound. 7363, sorry, I'm nerding out here, is one where they used to make mats when they did analog um, animation techniques using optical printer to make, you know, to mat out something and to put something else behind it. Um, and I stocked up on that when they were saying that was going out and I actually still have loads in my fridge. And what's nice about that stock is that there's no grays, it's basically just black or white, where 7363 has much more of a gradient of grays. Um, anyways, that being said, so when we finished J, there were labs there that were really really pumping out release prints in a beautiful way. And I went and saw several, I saw that film screen all around various festivals. And whenever that film played, they would obviously, the sound was the first thing people want to talk about. And Lucas sadly didn't get to travel with me and I was trying to answer for him. And he's, as you can tell, he's much more articulate than I am about music. And uh, so, but then the new film that we did, I found it was really a struggle to find a decent release print. I'm still not really satisfied with the release print. The sound was also very difficult to do because the place I did the optical print, uh, the optical sound, um, it no longer exists. It's actually in someone's basement now that they're doing it. So I don't know. Frankly, I'm sort of reached the point where I don't know if I'm going to release on 16 anymore because it's just not, it's just, you just can't. And our, my good friend, who's also a brilliant filmmaker, Lisa Morris, who's a local hero, is, going, is now uh, making tons of amazing work. And she's also having a lot of problems with uh, release prints. And it's just, it's, just, it's just that craft of releasing the print is, is really hard. Uh, processing, it's okay. You can find places to do negative and whatever and to get scans, but really releasing to make a theatrical 16 millimeter print, it's very, very difficult. Um, so, I mean, I have always, I guess I always work on 16, uh, except for the feature we shot on video. So we've always worked on 16 millimeter together. And, um, and because Lucas has such an expertise on that very idea of that transferring from the digital world to the analog world, and both of us love the idea of it 
entering the analog world and projected on the way a 60 millimeter projector has that, what is it, the reading light? Yeah. yeah. Like, but the op it has the optical sensor, which is actually turning the sound essentially into light, which is then turned back into sound. So the... Um, it's, a, it's really at the core of what we mean when we say analog. You know, I, I realize I can be a bit pedantic about this, but analog is so fascinating that I think it's worth not being really specific about what do we mean when we say analog. Because analog isn't just a specific medium. Analog is when something in one medium is transferred to another medium. It becomes an analog. An analog. Um, like quite literally, it's not the medium, it's the process. You know, we use it differently, but that's really what it means. So in, um, in sound and music, there's actually a couple other layers of analog recording and also mechanical recording, which is, you know, it's debatable whether we even really want to call it analog uh, because it's mechanical. The, what's really clear in like magnetic recording is that we have a sound wave which is turned into electricity, which is turned back into uh, sound via, the mo via motion. The analog process in an optical print is how we have a sound wave which is turned into a, um, a, a essentially a mapping of the vibrations in a visual format, which then to hear it doesn't just go directly back uh, like it would say within the magnetic process, but it goes with light shining through it and then another uh, optical sensor reacting to it, which then turns it into electricity, which then turns it into sound. So there's quite a few steps in the process to muddy the waters, which is pretty interesting. But in, um, but you know, like you're saying, uh, Saul, about how difficult it is, I think that uh, to find a good print of things these days, I think that's something that in music has happened a little while ago, uh, where um, it's very difficult to uh, to find like a good um, uh, like like a good vinyl press. There are some good vinyl presses out there now, but for quite a while there were no, there were none, and that getting like an LP released was really difficult. Cassette release also similarly very difficult to get it to sound good. There was just a few little basement operations, but there is a resurgence. But in the meantime, what happened was a whole host of strategies that musicians and uh, people working in sound found, which was to use an analog within the process and then to release things digitally. Like it's very, it's, it's, you pay for it, but it's worthwhile. The process of recording to an analog, to analog tape and then releasing that as a digital format, many people will agree that, you know, that those records sound really good because of how the, um, the, the magnetic tape adds harmonic distortion, you know, in a really pleasant way, which is kind of like what, uh, it's not really like what our ears do, it's what we, it's kind of a little bit adding our, a veneer of what we wish things sounded like. So um, I think the analog process in filmmaking I, I think that those processes are in the are getting hopefully getting sorted out. You know that it's not going to be as common and as easy to find a good a good lab, but hopefully there will be some in the future, because that process it adds. Uh, you know, how can I say it? tangible intangibles, <laughs> like measurable intangibles? Mm -hmm. It ad it adds some things that are outside of the uh, the artist's control. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I fell in love with, um, I'm not sure now if I call it analog, celluloid film. Is, that, is it analog? Is it not analog? But I love, I love this, you know, real, def true definition of analog. Um, but I fell in love with this type of film um, in art school, so... Yeah, years ago. And I think there was, you know, there was something about the... For me, it's less the quality and more the conceptual nature of it. So, you know, also because I, I think I just don't care that much about the quality. Like, I'm like, if it's really, really high quality or if there's lots of scratches and um, imperfections, I kind of, like, love those things. So I don't really care so much about, like, the high quality of the turnout if it's digital or, or celluloid film or whatever. But I really care that I touched the physical surface of that film. Um, either by doing like a handmade process like um, 
moonograms, which is a, a type of, of filmmaking I do where I, I um, use moonlight and sprinkle sand or, or, or basically whatever's on the nature floor onto my film to expose the film. Um, kind of like a phytogram, if you know what that is. Um, or, you know, phytograms where you put the plants directly onto the film, which I think, you know, some of us have had um, lovely experience doing that as well. So an imprint of the plant physically there, or in this case with Emerge, you know, I was, in, I was moving my body um, in a landscape that I wasn't familiar with. So I was in San Isidro Mazitepec in uh, Mexico uh, for a residency that we were basically there to make work about the plants there. Um, which I felt it was hard. I didn't make the, that film until maybe the, my last few days there. I mostly spent time every morning getting up early uh, bird watching <laughs> and, um, and, and just spending time with the plants and getting to know them. Um, there was a wonderful woman, Maria, there who was from, from there, lived on the land, and, and was kind of teaching me the Spanish names of the plants and the medicinal benefits of the plants. And I'm really into um, medicinal herbs, herbs as well. Um, so. I would kind of, my process is more like engaging. So with the, I guess I'm talking about plant, make plants and the celluloid, but every day I would make a big pot of tea that was using these medicinal herbs that I was learning about and I would share it with everybody. That was just part of my routine. The birding was part of my routine, trying to, to get into the landscape and understand what was there um, because I was very aware that I was a visitor in that land. Um, I mean, I'm a visitor in this land as well, uh, but it was very, very apparent uh, there. Um, and then and then I would take you know, the, this tea <laughs> concoction, I would take some of it or I would make, make a new batch and then I would add the vitamin C and the washing soda, which turns it into a developer and develop the, the, the film that I had made. Um, after, after, you know, emerge the, the visuals that you're seeing is, is my body interacting with, with the plants and trying to get to know them in maybe like a type of a dance um, or a type, kind of like you were saying with the sound and the vegetables, you were improvising with the vegetables and kind of listening to them maybe and responding. I was doing that with my body. I was trying to engage um, in that way. Um, and, then, and then taking those plants that were in, visually in the film, the ones that I was building a relationship with, and then going in the dark room and feeling my film with my hands and gloves, because <laughs> it's still a little bit, you know, itchy on your hands, but it's not, you don't, you know, it's not as toxic. You don't need the, the crazy mask and everything as, as intensely, although it's safe to do whatever protective things you want to <laughs> to protect your body from any type of chemistry. Um, the ecofilm processing feels a lot safer for the body. Um, but yeah, it, I think I just, I really love the tactile tangibility of like the whole process, like, you know, from, from shooting the film or you know doing a very handmade technique to then putting putting the film in the buckets and then hanging it to dry like on a clothesline outside, rolling it up, putting it into a projector and then seeing that that physical object that you manipulated from your memories, your experience, your imprint to then be projected onto another surface for others to witness I think is, is such a beautiful, um, experience and it's so and I think because it's kind of this it's it's we're kind of losing this art form you know it's it and, or this documentation it's not even art form at, originally right it was just to document life this you know method of documenting life we're kind of losing it and I think I have this real obsession with kind of um, holding on to things and, and grasping them until they're gone. <laughs> like really like doing that. So I think, you know, there's a part of me that just wants to kind of hold on to this beautiful medium before it's just like, it just won't exist at some point in time, you know? Like, I mean, knock on wood, but like it just won't probably, you know, because there's so many technologies that are just very advanced. And, you know, I mean, that's why we, we started the Handmade Film Collective is we really believe in, you know, trying to introduce film making to, to other people. But the reality is that it, it's kind of, I guess I love the nostalgia of just trying to kind of continue it um, and to have a really, you know, physical relationship with that physical archive, that physical, you know, piece of material. So I prefer to shoot all my films and, and project them if I can um, on the film itself. That's why I do the reversal. So there's a positive image. However, this, a few films where I've made 
Um, I've done sound or have done, like, I've actually not used the optical printer. <laughs> guilty. Uh, I'm guilty, but I just, I feel, I did do a workshop with Alex Lagos, which was awesome, but I just, it's just so tedious, and I just haven't done it, nor have I used a Steenbeck for editing. So I'm like, the moments where I've edited to cut it, because literally, if you want to edit film, you have to cut it and tape it together over and over and over. Like, this is quite intense, which I think I would love to do at one point is, like, actually use the optical printer and the Steenbeck to, you know, literally, but I think that would be a very, like the reason would be very, to be very involved with that process. Um, but editing in camera feels so much easy, easier for me. So I do that, or I, or I have edited a couple films post in post digitally, but um, if I don't need to, like Emerge is just, all of it is just on the film. So I made it digital to put it online, that's the only reason. Um, so yeah, my vote is analog all the way. <laughs> Done. I feel like we need to do a group work together that uses the uh, the optical printer, but that's yeah, we yeah. should. <laughs> I need that push. I'm not going to do it otherwise. Um, but what you said, kind of about documenting too. I was thinking about that when I was doing uh, working with the fruits and vegetables. That because because uh, like celluloid is is very archival, right? It lasts for a long time, which is why why we use it. Um, as you know, digital has changed a lot. Um, I was thinking, what if like years from now, people are looking at this film and they see this like peach or this avocado, like me, and there's no and there's no more left. Like I was like, whoa. Well, um, <laughs> not to be like, yeah. Uh, but uh, the reason why I also like working um, uh, kind of analog is is because I would never have been able to make this film uh, like with with all like the the little lines and the little dots like I you can do that digitally but that's like the plant saying this is what I want to be at this time now um, and I think that's that's really cool um, and I it would be really nice if I could do that like edit it all together on the steam back but uh, I really like editing digitally. It's it's a different um, headspace, and I, I I also like what you said about like the the touching of the film and the making the developer and all that time you spend and and uh, the, and, the, and the testing and then you get it. Um, but I also like to get into another headspace with editing, um, and and even also with the sound design. Like it's it just takes it to to a different place for me as an artist to, to put it together. Um, so I, I kind of like digital and, and the analog as well. Great. Well, I'm reminded of um, a really inspiring talk that Tom Sherman gave when he came to visit NASCAD, uh, which uh, you're, you're probably there, Saul. Mm -hmm. um, and when he gave this uh, account of meeting Marshall McLuhan and it was very interesting because he was young and um, he really wanted to talk to Marshall McLuhan about being a video artist, even though he hadn't really started being a video artist yet. And he was really nervous about it, but he did eventually t introduce himself to Marshall McLuhan and said, yeah, hey, hi. and he said, well, what, what do you do? And he said, well, I'm a video artist. And Marshall McLuhan said, oh, I'm sorry. And, <laughs> and, and he was crushed, but he said, well, why are you sorry? And he said, because no medium can, be, uh, can really be very useful for art until it becomes obsolete. <laughs> and I, I've thought about that, that statement quite a bit, and I, th I think that that's one of the things that unifies a lot of our interest in these, uh, these media that are no longer the current way that we do things. They know, that... You know, 16. Uh, I remember watching 16 millimeter films like in school as a kid, and lots of these ones you were taught. We were looking at in the archives before for all these official government purposes, advertising purposes, all these kind of quotidian things, which were kind of foolish. And now those things are not the way that information is communicated. And what we're left with is the artists who are actually appreciating what the medium does that other media doesn't do. And you know that tactile nature, and the fact that you can actually be really casual about it if you want, and still get something really interesting. You know, though, you know, I'm, that's part of my response to what you're saying there. One other thing before I forget it, um, Don, you're talking about the sound of the vegetables, and there's there is this um, 
this kind of very small movement of sound artists who, uh, that David Toop is one who comes to mind, who did all of this work uh, of using fruits and vegetables to generate synthesizer tones because of, based on the chemical nature of the fruits and vegetables, because there's gonna be a different, um, chemical relationship between them. Like, you know how you can like power a clock off a potato? Yeah, Same yeah. idea, you can power a synthesizer off a potato. And a potato will sound different than a lemon, then different than, yeah. and so on and so forth. So that's my little thing that maybe that Nerding would be. Nerding out. Maybe that would be a good nerd, nerdy tip. Yes, thank you that you're sharing that. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna check. There was one question. Um, actually, because we're the editing, so the question. Um, So, so the question, just for the recording, is how Rena achieved the multiple shots. Uh, I think the the like the superimposition is that uh, how that was achieved. Yeah. So um, at this residency, I, I it, it was my first time really using the Bolex, which is a camera that shoots 16 millimeter film. So that one I was talking about, but that's a bit bigger of a of a surface area and uh, a little bit higher quality. Um, and so the Bolex can do fancy things like double exposure, which the Super 8 cameras don't tend to do, I mean, unless you like, you know, break them open. I think Alex would also have done it, like break it open, really rewind it, and shoot it again, which I would love to try at some point. But um, this was much more straightforward. So um, actually, I just shot the film of, I would set up a tripod, and I would put it on a self-timer, and I would dance, and then I would rewind the film. And then I would, I, I think you had to, you had, you had to do some math here, which I don't remember, because I don't love math, so I don't always remember the numbers, but you can't let in as much light as you normally would for one shot, otherwise it'll become very um, overexposed, because um, too much light will be coming into the camera, so you, you know, you change your f-stop, which is just the, you know, the space that lets light in, basically. Um, is that f-stop on a Bolex as well, or am I thinking of 35 mil? Anyways. You just basically change it so that you only let in um, a little bit less light each time. Just imagine if you were like putting on lights in this room and you wanted to do it slowly over time. You just put, if you wanted to do it three times, you would just do a little bit of light, a little bit more, and a little bit more. So the idea is that I think a third of the light or something, depending on how many um, times I want it to be, I think three or four is what I was doing in that film. So yeah, that's basically the process is you shoot it once, in the, at, at a you know a, a darker exposure, and then you would shoot it again, and then rewind it, and shoot it again, and rewind it, and it's it's quite it is fun. It's it's a tech, technicality that I found quite fun, um, and it was just a technique I'd never done before, so I wanted to explore that, and I was really also thinking about um, you know being in that landscape and kind of how I could engage with maybe my own body and also uh, with you know just just kind of relationships and movement is kind of what I was thinking about as well. Um, but that's the process that I use. So it was all in camera, which is my favorite way, again, of editing. <laughs> Very basic. Thank you. Um, so uh, I just want to throw it to end uh, a question. Do you think we should be teaching kids to eco-process and use 16 yes. millimeter? hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm partly inspired by, um, uh, by you know, this idea of the obsolescence um, of the medium being inspiring and just sort of thinking about how to carry that obsolescence forward. So I kind of, I just have this image of like five-year-olds eco-processing and I think it's awesome. I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> well, we've done that. I mean, uh, did we do that in Halifax? I know in Winnipeg we did that um, yeah? with the Windex Festival, but it was not eco-processing, it was uh, painting on film. And uh, where was I when we did that? Oh, I think yeah. we did that in Caracat, which is in New Brunswick. Um, I was there with a filmmaker named Carl Lemieux, who's from uh, the Double Negative Collective. And one thing I want to mention as well, on what you, you folks are saying, like about the idea of like you know once and once once an instrument becomes obsolete, it becomes something, or an apparatus becomes obsolete, then it becomes art. That's why there's the significance of a lot of collectives popping up and making work together because it is a lot of collecting gear. It's a lot of sort of learning, you know, sort of rescuing stuff. Um, and so all across, I mean, you, I, you know, I think you folks know more than I do. There's, like, there's so many collectives around the world who do sort of like the handmade film collective and sort of like work together, inspire each other, communicate with each other, share techniques. Um, but yeah, so what I think they did, we did that in Winnipeg for Windex. We also did that in um, 
in Karaket. So Carl was teaching all these kids how to like paint on 16 millimeter and then, uh, and then project it. And it was really quite magical, um, you know, because for, for, for these kids, it was a way of actually like, you know, saying it's the tactility of image is something that's very foreign to, you know, as a father of a nine year old, I can tell you it's very much, you know, if for them, it's a very unique thing to have something that's slowed down. It also takes a lot of patience, but, um, yeah, I, I think in eco-processing, I, I don't know about eco-processing because I'm, I'm curious like how five-year-olds would, I mean, if you've done that, I mean, how would five-year-olds, would they have the patience? Because now my kid would not sit around because eco-processing takes a long, like it's much longer processing time than it's like 20 minutes or something like that sometimes, I guess what you do. With Can be an hour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm remembering some of the uh, filmmaking uh, parties that the, the wonderful Helen Hill yes. would do. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that she, uh, to answer that question, she said, that's when you have cotton candy. <laughs> and she did, took that very seriously. She had a cotton candy machine at, <laughs> while teaching people how to do like handmade film and, and bathtub processing. Yeah. And they would try all kinds of different chemicals. And I know that she did workshops with it, with teenagers anyway. Mm -hmm. And when things took a while, you'd make more cotton candy. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, it certainly um, wouldn't use harsh chemistry with children. <laughs> you know, there's some of those, some of those, the really intense ones are like really, really bad. Like, I remember when I first learned about this hydrogen, not hydrogen peroxide, the chemical version of reversal bleach. And the person who taught me was like, yeah, you just can't, I think you just like can't get pregnant within like five years of using this film because your kids will have defects or something. Like, it was just like very, um, it's very toxic, but, but everyone, yeah, anyway, everyone has different comfort levels, but I am not into that chemistry anymore. Anymore. I've used it once in my life, but not now. Um, for eco-processing, I would still, you know, wear gloves. So it's like, how do you get kids? I mean, it's washing soda. That's the only thing that I would worry about because of the itch. It can make your hands kind of irritated and itchy. And the hydrogen peroxide bleach is still bleach, so the hydrogen peroxide can like burn your hands a little and cause them to get white, which I've done many times. Like, it's no problem. It's just <laughs> maybe not for children. Um, but what I think would be really, well, I've, what I've done when, if some video art camps at a Strutz Gallery um, in Sackville, New Brunswick, is um, drawing on film. So similar to that painting idea, drawing or scratching um, with, you know, like something not too sharp. But like, these kids are like maybe 7 to 11 kind of age group. And they loved it because they could really see how animation worked. Um, because they could draw, like I kind of explained it and it was hard to wrap their head around it until they saw it, the film being projected. Like I was kind of saying like, every 24 times you draw in a square, like that's gonna be one second. So you really have to draw it many times. Like, and they were like, ah. but so it is very meticulous, but some of the kids got really, really into it and were like obsessively drawing like so many smiley faces in a certain, you know, and then changing the smiley face and like you could tell they get really, so it was, and then, and then they get to see it right away. So most filmmaking, you know, it, it takes a while and I guess, you know, digitally, <laughs> everything's right away. But in this process, you know, I guess, I think it, it maybe helps them understand like where images originated from because the reality is that they didn't originate on iPads, you know? And it's like, that's all, <laughs> that's all our, like one-year-olds can use iPads at this point in, in history. It's crazy, like I don't even understand. But yeah, basically I think, what I think a really cool workshop, what we should do, Don, is a phytogram workshop with kids because I think plant, uh, like really meticulously putting plants down on film and it's outside in the sunshine, so it's not in the dark um, and it doesn't take very long, like, it's a very quick process. This would be like, you know, a few minutes or whatever, and then you you can actually fix it in salt water, so it doesn't need to be any harsh chemistry. Um, and then you just like meticulously are putting, you know, soaking plants in the plant-based developer, and then really slowly, not slowly, it just, it can be really quick. You can just splatter plants on and it'll still make a design, but you can get really meticulous about it. And I think, I think some kids who like, especially are nature lovers would really love that kind of process of like, really, I love, I love phytograms because it's really just like, you know, it's a really lovely practice. And I think you do have to maybe have some kids, like five-year-olds, I don't know. I just don't know how they're just gonna focus. But if you have some kids who are a little bit older who like really like slower paced activities, I think it could be really um, a beautiful way of understanding, you know, the natural world around you and also being able to understand, okay, we put that on the film and then we project it through light and we see it big. Okay, that makes sense to me, you know? Um, so I just also just think kids should be definitely learn about film because I just think it's so great and magical. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, we should do that. Um, it's uh, yeah. It's just like a, it's a. It's also like a part of the historical process, right? And I think it's it's good to know that. Um, 
But also that being said, I wouldn't necessarily take really small children to do it. I mean, eco-processing um, is, is much better for the environment, but also it's you still have to be safe about it. Like, you know, when you're boiling uh, hot peppers, that's gonna get in your, in your eyes and that those, those are gonna, those fumes are gonna come up and that's when it gets a little, little dangerous or intense. But yeah, yeah, everybody should at least try it. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Um, and thank you for seriously nerding out. It's really, really inspiring, um, as is all of your work. Um, so just a reminder for those who are watching the live stream, the films, if you, if you haven't had a chance to see them yet, or if you want to rewatch them, the films will be available for another half hour, 40 minutes, something like that. Um, I would also like to uh, invite you, urge you to attend the Halifax Independent Filmmakers Festival, which is happening online from November 12th to 15th. Anthology for Fruits and Vegetables will be in it. Saul has a piece uh, in that as well. In the, these are both in the Atlantic Auteurs program. Um, and that is, is uh, opening up on November 13th. Um, but I, I really encourage you to take a look at the whole program. Um, as I said, November 12th to 15th, some really, really great stuff. Uh, and, and HIF, Halifax Independent Filmmakers Festival, it's one of those events that just make me happy. You know, it's one of those high points of the year. So you, 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 it, you'll really enjoy it. It'll, you'll get a lot of, out of it. Um, okay, so thank you all so much for your time. This, is so, this has been so much fun. And thank you very much for sharing your work and your ideas with us. Take care, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>